Good afternoon. I'm EJ King. I'm Lucas Blocka, and you're tuned in to put me in, Coach. With the NBA All-Star Weekend out of close, we had some exciting events and some not so exciting, exciting events. To start the weekend off, we began with the NBA Celebrity Game. Some notable players in the game were Mark Cuban, owner of Dallas Mavericks, Baron Davis, NBA legend, Romeo Miller, actor and recording artist, Nick Cannon, actor and recording artist, Jason Williams, NBA legend, and the most remembered player of the game, Jarius Robertson. Yeah, the final score was the East beating the West, 88 to 59, and Baron, Brandon Armstrong was named MVP. But that was not the most memorable part of this year's game. In the fourth quarter, 14-year-old Jarius Robertson, who was battling a chronic liver disease, checked in. He immediately was given the ball and drained a 10-foot shot for two points, going one for one on a very memorable night. Next up on the weekend came the BBVA Compass Rising Stars Challenge, where the world team came up on top over Team USA with a score of 150 to 141. Yeah, and a few notable players from that game include uh, Jamal Murray from the Denver Nuggets and Buddy Heald, who now plays for the Sacramento Kings. And for Team USA, their notable players include Carl Anthony Towns from the Minnesota Timberwolves and Frank Kaminsky from the Charlotte Hornets. Each of these players had a great game, all scoring over 25 points, and Murray and Towns each scored, a, each recorded a double-double with rebounds and assists. The following day, we began the night with the three most popular events of the night. The Taco Bell Skills Challenge, the JBL three-point contest, and the Verizon Slam Dunk Contest. First up, we had the Taco Bell Skills Challenge. In the final round, we had Gordon Hayward and Chris, and Chris Stapps, Przingis. Each were neck and neck for the first three challenges. And when arriving at to the three-point shot, Porzingis was able to splash his first. And for a second year in a row, a big man won the competition. Yeah. Up next, we had the JBL three-point contest where finalists Kyrie Irving and Eric Gordon squared off. After each of them tied at a score of 20 to beat Kemba Walker's score, they each had to go into a bonus round, which, was not ha which has not happened since 2012. In the bonus round, Kyrie was hot in the corners, going 8 for 10, but cooled off in between, only scoring a total of 18 points. When Eric Gordon came to shoot, he began cold, going 2 for 5, but then went on to sink 11 of his next 12 shots, tallying a score of 21. Yeah, and with Eric Gordon's win, he became the first player in Rockets history to win a three-point contest. Wow. To end the night, we had the Verizon Slam Dunk Contest, where last year's runner-up Aaron Gordon would face off against DeAndre Jordan, Derek Jones Jr., and Glenn Robinson III. Yeah, the opening round fell a little short of everyone's expectations after last year's competition. Uh, Aaron Gordon, after coming off of an injury, he was just not capable of getting it as high in the air as he did last year. True shame. Yeah, it was, it was rough to watch. For this contest, our two finalists were Derek Jones Jr. and Glenn Robinson III. Robinson started out strong in the first round according to a score of 50 with his reverse dunk over two people with one person on another's shoulders. He then came out and jumped over teammate Paul George with a windmill to add on and finally ended with a reverse dunk over three people. Yeah, Jones Jr. came out powerful as well, throwing down a tomahawk-style dunk over four people. With well, the next round came with a windmill between the legs off the backboard. In the end, however, Glenn Robinson III was able to edge out the win with a total score of 94 to 87. Finally, we ended the weekend with the 66th annual NBA All-Star Game. To the players, this game is more about fun and excitement for the fans than it is winning. That being said, the final score was a whopping 192 to 182 with the West coming out as the victors. Yeah, notable players for this game included uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and Russell Westbrook. Yeah. When the game was finished, Anthony Davis was named MVP, recording a total of 52 points and 10 rebounds. But one of the most memorable parts of the game was when Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant put their differences aside, and even though it was f for one play, they still uh, made it happen. He threw a nice lob to Westbrook. Before the ball even went through the hoop, each bench went crazy with joy, and the crowd was even louder.
Penguins captain Sidney Crosby earned his 1,000th career point on February 16th against the Winnipeg Jets. With this point, he became the 12th fastest player in NHL history to achieve this goal. Yeah, and the point came off an assist with a Chris Kunitz go following it up. Yeah. Uh, he then became the 86th player to ever reach 1,000 career points. This achieve achievement has only been accomplished twice in Penguin hi Penguins history. The only other Penguin Penguins to do so was Mar Mario Lemieux and Yamir Yager. Yeah, Yager, I'm pretty sure, did it for another team, though, not on the Penguins. Yeah. Yeah. At only yeah, 29 years right. old, however, we still have a few years left to watch Crosby create an even greater legacy for himself. The Pens later went on in the game to take it into overtime, where they won. The person to score the final goal was Crosby himself. Yeah, the captain was in tears, and he received a standing ovation from the fans after the game and during his yeah. thousandth point. Yeah, it was awesome. The Maple Leafs, the Blues, and the Penguins are to host the outdoor games for this NHL season. On New Year's Day, the Toronto Maple Leafs hosted the Detroit Red Wings at the BMO Field in Toronto in the NHL Seminole Classic. The Maple Leafs defeated the Red Wings 5-4 in overtime with a goal by Austin Matthews, rookie sensation. The win came in front of over 40,000 fans. Yeah, the game started real slow with just one goal through the first two periods. In the 2017 Winter Classic on January 2nd, the St. Louis Blues hosted the Chicago Blackhawks. Yeah, the Blackhawks were making their fifth appearance in an outdoor game and their third appearance in the Winter Classic. It was the first appearance for the, Blue, for the Blues in an outdoor game, however. St. Louis Blues won 4-1 to one behind Jake Allen and the, their star Vladimir Tarasenko, scoring two goals in the third period, making it 3-1 to one game. An empty net goal gave the Blues the final score of 4-1. to one. Now, the 2017 Coors Light NHL Stadium Series is going Heinz Field this year in Pittsburgh. Stadium Series is an outdoor regular season game being played at a football or baseball field in order to get more fans to come out and enjoy the game and bring it back to its roots. Yeah, this year uh, it will be played at the home of Pittsburgh Steelers at Heinz Field this Saturday, February 25th. Uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins will also will host the Philadelphia Flyers. Yeah, and the, the, Penguins fly, uh, the Penguins Flyers rivalry goes all the way back to when they both entered the league in the 67-68 season. The game is being played to help mark the 50th anniversary of the expansion in, that, in 67. Yeah, the Flyers, uh, Penguins, and four other teams were formed to double the league size. Uh, when we come back, we'll discuss who are the league leaders and possible trade happenings. Let's move on to some, some stats we have so far into this NHL season. Starting with points, we have a young sensation, Connor McDavid, coming into the first racking up a total of 67 points in only 59 games, helping bring his team, the Edmonton Oilers, in the second place after finishing last in their division last season. Speaking of McDavid, he's also the leading, the leading, he's also leading the NHL in assists this year as well, with 47. Wow. Yeah, so it's looking like he's finding himself in that lead uh, facilitator role and is playing very well. Yeah. Next, we have our goal leader so far, and to pretty much nobody's surprise, it's Sidney Crosby from the Pittsburgh Penguins. And looking, looking like he's going to go back to his more aggressive role this season with a total of 32 goals so far. But he's also helping set up his teammates, having 33 assists with that, trailing McDavid for the point leading just by a little bit. We'll have to see if he can continue playing like this and help Pittsburgh take first place over the Washington uh, Capitals as we come to a close on the season. 
Yeah, we talked about the offensive side of things. So now let's move on more of the defensive side, uh, specifically going with goaltending. Yeah, and the hottest goalie this season is obviously Devin Dubnik from the Minnesota Wild. He's leading the league in goals allowed, save percentage, and wins. Yeah, he's only allowing an average of 1.7 goals a game, uh, and he's saving an average of 0.934% uh, shots. Yeah, and he's totaled 32 wins, which is really impressive at this stage. Yeah, right. Especially with how, how much less they play goaltenders now. Since yeah. the start of the 2016, 2017 NHL season, five head coaches have lost their jobs. After the All-Star break this season, three coaches got terminated. And on February 1st, the St. Louis Blues fired Ken Hitchcock, forcing an early retirement, replacing him with associate coach Mike Yao. On, on the 7th, the Boston Bruins fired Claude Julian as coach, replacing him with assistant Bruce Cassidy. So far, both teams are playing well since the switch. Finally, on the 14th, the Montreal Canadiens terminated Michael Therrien and their head coach replacing him with a recently unemployed Julian. These two are no strangers to the situation. Back in 2002-2003 season, prior to the lockout, the exact same switch was made midseason. Yeah, and with the trade deadline coming up on March 1st, a lot of teams with little to no chance of making the playoffs are looking to pick up draft picks and dump cap-heavy players in order to invest in their future, while teams on the bubble or just seem to be missing a key piece to make a run to the Stanley Cup are looking to add one of those players. Let's take a look at the top five who are likely to be traded this year before the deadline. Yep. Uh, Matt, Matt Duchesne, uh, center, Colorado Avalanche. Uh, he got $6 million cap average salary. Yeah, so he's kind of heavy on that. And as it's going to be hard to dump him necessarily in Colorado Avalanche, even though they know he's a good player. Yeah. They, they feel like they can get some picks out of that. Yeah. Number two on our list is Kevin Shattenkirk. He's a, he's a right-handed defenseman. He's great at moving the puck, and he has 40 points this season. Wow. His contract's on the last year, though, and they're not sure if they can resign him, so they're looking to dump him. Yeah. Uh, ben Bishop is a goalie for Tampa Bay Lightning. He's, uh, he's got a pretty high uh, percentage expansion. Um, he has a 919 save percentage, as yeah. you were referring to. Yeah. And with the expansion draft coming up, Tampa Bay is only allowed to, to save one goalie from possibly being taken away. So if they can get rid of him, they can save one of their younger goaltenders in order to build for next season. Number four, we have Gabriel Landeskog, a left wing from the Colorado Avalanche. He's a 24-year-old captain with a 5.5 million cap hit and 52 points in four of his last five seasons. Now, some might think it's insane that you trade a player who's doing that well for your team yeah. and that good. But the thing is, he's young, his, his salary's gonna go up, teams can use him, and Colorado really needs to rebuild when they're sitting at the bottom of the charts. Yeah, right, they do. Uh, Jerome McGinley is right wing, Colorado Avalanche, final year of his contract, and he struggled a lot this season. He had seven goals and eight assists uh, in 54 games as of February 14th. However, Aginla has 68 points in 81 playoff games, so for young teams with little to no playoff experience, it could be a very attractive addition. Yeah, and with a tight race in the Atlantic Division for, for a, a spot in the top three, two teams have been grinding it out as of late. The Boston Bruins, winners of four straight, and the Florida Panthers win, win their last five. Every other team in the division, as you can see, has been stuck right around the 500 mark in their last 10 games except these two. If the Panthers keep, on, keep their offense firing on all cylinders, Expect to see them in the playoffs come summertime. Yeah, the Bruins, on the other hand, under new head coach Cassidy, they have been practically unbeatable. They have been playing exceptionally well in their own and backed up by Tuka Rask, who had a huge shutout against the division leader, Montreal Canadiens. Defenseman Tory Krug, who has been an assist machine this year, and Brad Marchand, who, who is their point leader at 59 points. Yeah, and if you look at the Montreal Canadiens in the last 10, they're only 3-6-1. and one. I mean, you have a top team in your division slipping like that. It leaves space open for the younger teams or the lower teams on the list like Florida and Boston to slip right in there. Yeah. And with the league's best teams this year, the Metro Division is a hotbed of competition. Defending Stanley Cup chance, the champs, the Pittsburgh Penguins, have been closing in on division-leading caps. Only about two weeks ago, they were trailing by about 10 points. Yeah. And with Sidney Crosby on fire as of late, scoring his 1,000 point on an, an, on an assist, along with an OT game winner in the same game, it wouldn't be hard to see them taking the lead in the division. The Rangers, on the other hand, had a tough stretch leading up to the All-Star break, with shaky goaltending from the usually solid Henrik Lundqvist, winning six of their last eight and seven of their last ten. And as you can see, Columbus right above them, ever since they went on that historic 16-game winning streak, yeah. they've pretty much been a 500 team since then. Yeah. 
other things to notice is the Philadelphia Flyers, who are just have just been terrible since they had what did they have a 10, 11 game win streak early on. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I don't know. They haven't been doing too much. Yeah, now they have a negative uh, negative 25 differential in goal scoring. Jeez. They just can't seem to stop it. Yeah. And pretty much New Jersey and Carolina are right where they usually are, bottom of the list ever since mm -hmm. Brodeur's left Jersey. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> with the Wild leading the division with tied for league's best 39 wins, it would appear that they will continue their uh, year-long success and keep winning games. Their team is full of talent this year with players like Michael Gronlund and Miko Kuvo and the ri rev revival of Eric Stahl after down a year with split time between Carolina and the Rangers. On the back end, on the back end Devin Dubuck <laughs> has been on fire with 32 wins and a whopping save percentage of .933 on the season. As for the rest of the division, you can accept to see Chicago and St. Louis in the playoffs. The Blackhawks for the past decade seem like the team seem seem like the team seemed like a team that just can't be put down thanks to players like Patrick Kane and Corey Crawford. Now that the Blues, in my opinion, will be the last team in the division to make the playoffs. Nashville has been wildly inconsistent all, all around, especially from starting goaltender Pika Ryan. All right. The returning Stanley Cup finalists, to practically no one's surprise, are leading one of the weakest divisions in the NHL right now, anchored down by a variety of beards like Joe Thornton and Brent Burns, who's third on the point list and not so quite hairy 52-point scorer Joe Pavelski. Meanwhile, Edmonton, around the second-year phenom Connor McDavid, had been playing relatively well despite the lack of true veteran presence. When they made the move to acquire Cam Talbot, who despite only having prolonged stretch as a starting goaltender due to injury, has become a strong presence and another reason the team's quick turnaround. The next, the next three teams will all probably find themselves in the playoffs on this list. Calgary, currently sitting in the final wildcard spot, have been riding on a solid 10-game streak of 6-3-1. and one. Complement that with their players like Johnny Goudreau and TJ Brody on the back end, and you can expect to see a strong finish from them. The last team that should make it into the playoffs will be the LA Kings. We know the Kings have, haven't had trouble putting shots on net this year. Their main problem seems to be getting it past the goalkeeper. Looking at their record, it's easy to, to doubt, but don't forget the big bad man between the pipes, Jonathan Quick. For roughly four months, the Kings have been without their star goaltender Quick. However, in early to mid-March, they are expecting to see his return with a, more, with a morale boost given by a two-time Stanley Cup champion, as well as an Olympian. The Kings will be ready to turn, it up, turn up the heat as the season is winding down. Everyone knows the hottest teams at the end of 82 games is the most dangerous, and the Kings will likely be one of those teams. Yeah, Las Vegas Golden, <laughs> Golden Knights expansion draft is coming up with the trade deadline looming in March, and with that, a team can only protect one goalie. The buzz is that Penguins goalie Mark Andre Fleury will get traded before the right for the right at the trade deadline. Yeah, the market for the top NHL goalie at the trade deadline might be drier than we all thought. Sources have told ESPN that the Dallas Stars and Pittsburgh Penguins have had have had a preliminary discussion about go goalie Mark Andre Fleury. Fleury's departure from the Penguins that has been impending has been written in stone since Matt Murray led the team to a Stanley Cup last season. The 32-year-old veteran carries a big 5.75 million cap, but that should not scare off the Dallas Stars. Yeah. And I'd like to thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Put Me In Coach. Tune in after spring break for the breakdown of the hottest news of the 2017 MLB spring training. And Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at TCTV. I'm EJ King. And I'm Luke Splaka.